Another thing that interested me about uh, setting a story in the Bears' ears was the fact that there are basically there were two really strong elements for turning it into a national monument, and one was the tremendous range of archaeological resources, but the other, and this one got less attention, was the terrific paleontology that is in this area. Something like 200 million years of fossils are at bear's ears. So when I was thinking about writing The Way of the Bear, I wondered how could I bring this into the book? And one thing that really fascinated me was how the paleontology, paleontological record uh, talks about the way life adapted to climate change. A lot of the fossils there kind of bridge the area between the, what they call the greenhouse age and the ice age, and then back to the greenhouse age. And those animals that adapted, the life forms that adapted, were those that had enough resources and enough flexibility to be able to survive that kind of climate. And I thought how interesting it is to think of paleontology speaking to something that is so relevant to us today. So as I am working on the way of the bear and learning more about paleontology, I'm also learning more about the market for fossils. And I'm learning about shark's teeth and common shell fossils that are sold to schools, sold for science projects. And then beyond that, I'm learning that there's kind of a black market in fossils and that once a fossil is, say, particularly dinosaur fossils, which are, are valuable on the black market, once those fossils are removed from wherever they're removed from, it's often hard for the person who has the fossil to prove that it was either from private land, which is legitimate, or to prove that it wasn't taken from public land, which would make it illegal to own it. And uh, particularly fossils of the major dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex can sell for many millions of dollars. And often these fossils are bought by rich celebrities and then they put them, they kind of hide them away in their mansions and nobody ever gets to see them again. And so there's a real conflict between scientists who believe these fossils are part of our shared heritage as humans and people who believe these fossils are almost like art and deserve to be you know, owned by the highest bidder. So I had some fun uh, exploring this in The Way of the Bear. One thing that I really enjoyed about writing The Way of the Bear was the opportunity it gave me to learn more about paleontology. So I was thinking, in, in the book, there's a skull, and I wanted to give the skull a name. So I thought, well, I, it, should, it should be a female name. So the, I did a little research about women paleontologists. And to my surprise, I discovered four women. I, I didn't discover them, but I came across their name, four women who had really been instrumental in the field of paleontology, three of whom I had never heard of. One is a woman named Mary Anning, who lived in England uh, uh, 19th century, and she was one of the first ones who changed the perspective about marine fossils. Another one, and this is a woman people have probably heard of, is Mary Douglas Leakey. And she was the one who found a skull that really changed our understanding of how old humanity was. Another woman who did a lot of really important paleontology work was Mary Higby Schweitzer. And she worked with one of our favorite fossils, Tyrannosaurus rex. She found blood cells in the, in the, in the bones and was also able to discover that one of the skeletons she found was actually a pregnant female Tyrannosaurus rex. And then there's another woman named Mary Dawson who was, uh, did, did her work on the Cenozoic era, and she was honored by the, one of the first women honored by the American Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. So when I thought of those, those four Marys, I thought, well, my skull will have to be named Mary too.